the, the purpose of what we're doing today uh, is to try to address some emergency situations that you get into. Uh, at, at some point, um, you know, every, everyone's going to have something happen. It's not if it's ever going to happen, but at some point, you know, some emergencies and accidents are likely going to occur in your grooming lifetime. Uh, so I so said we do have a little agenda here. We're going to spend a little bit more time maybe uh, up front on preparation and prevention than we will on actual emergencies, but we will cover both. And uh, what we're going to do here is, uh, my name is Rick Engasser. Uh, I'm from a snowmobile club out in western New York State. So my expertise is, is pretty much in, you know, hilly, snowy, wooded type uh, trail grooming operations. Uh, if you're, if you're anybody here in an avalanche area, okay, I know nothing about that, so we're going to depend on you for some help on that. How about water crossings? Anybody here do a lot of water crossing? Lakes, Perfect. Ponds. Lakes, ponds. Okay, perfect. Okay. Whenever you have a session like this, almost everybody that comes, uh, we thought we were up against the train deal, and, and we said, well, you know, most people have got it pretty well figured out. You know, if a train hits you, you're going to lose. Uh, but uh, there are actually going to be two different times. So we think that most of the people are here because they really want to be. But pretty much any time a, a person comes to a meeting like this, they're looking for something. They want to leave with something. And if anybody's got some things that they have in mind that they'd like to leave with, I'd like to know about them right now, and we will absolutely address them during uh, our presentation, Josh and I will. So anybody have some thoughts on what you'd like to leave with if, the, if there's something that uh, you say, geez, you know, uh, we never really thought about emergencies, but is there, you know, what do we do if we have a freeze up on the trail or what do we drop off a bank or whatever it is? Um, if you've got that kind of in your mind right now, tell me what you're looking for and we'll spend a little more time on it. Any thoughts? You're letting me off awful easy. Uh, okay, my partner here is, uh, is Josh. Yeah, I've met have seen most of you. I'm Josh Nelson. I'm the Piston Bully rep for here in northern New England, but um, I deal with a lot of this stuff. We always get a lot of questions that come up. We've also got some of the stuff as far as preparation and prevention, uh, some of that information as to how to be prepared for what might happen out on the trail. So that's how I got roped into this. Okay. <laughs> okay. Who, who here is actual groomer operators? All right, okay, and who are like the program managers, you know, and the association people, the administrators? Okay, we've got, you know, a mixture of both, and we will try to address, you know, things from uh, administrative, you know, county, state level, along with things that would be, you know, effective for the operators and the program managers. As we're going through, if you have a question, don't wait, just ask. It's a small enough group, and we are going to draw on the expertise of this group, you know. Josh and I are not going to do all the talking. That's the hope. <clears throat> Essentially, a little bit on, you know, some prevention, you know, early on is uh, a couple things you may want to consider if you're not already doing it is, is have a program where whenever your, your machine is out operating that your lights are on, uh, that you have some understanding with your club members uh, because if you think about it, you know, one of the issues that, that's going to happen is, is groomer versus sled. The groomer's always going to win, uh, you know, in that conflict. Uh, is how do, do your members understand how you overtake a groomer and how you pass one on a narrow trail? You know, is that part of your training with your club members or in your newsletter? A uh, little bit on, on, you know, having groomers on the trails. Do they understand the groomer has the right of way? Do they understand that it's really a nice thing to do to dim your lights when you come up to a groomer, you know, either coming up behind it or coming up in front of it? The guys that operate groomers at night know exactly what I'm talking about, about, you know, six or seven high beams coming after you all at once after you've had a long night. Um, and then is there a sign in your groomer saying that you have the right of way so we don't get that look out in the trail on a narrow trail where they expect you to move out of the way so they can pass you? big thing that uh, can make a difference, and Josh will share a little story with you about this, is who, if you have more than one operator, does your most experienced operator set the trail edge, and everybody else respects that edge? And go ahead, Josh, and tell them a story about 
you know, finding the edge on a trail. Yeah, we deal with it, uh, quite a bit where, especially when we demo machines out there, guys have set the trails with, with their particular machine, whatever it may be, and then they'll take another machine and head out on the trail and try to, everybody wants to push that edge out just a little bit farther. Everybody's trying to get that last couple inches off to the edge. And, you, know, you all know how that goes. And uh, we've had a number of times where the guys will be right hanging on that hairy edge and they get out over and break off into that softer snow and then the machine's off on the side. If you're in the wrong spot, you'll get the drag where it slides over off the edge and starts pulling you around by the tail end. So that's something you really want to be aware of is, is who's in charge of that? Who knows where the edges of those trails are? Who knows where the, you know, the, the gullies and things like that are at in the summer where once you've got six, eight feet of snow piled up out there and filled them all in, you don't know it until it's way too late. So. Good deal. And then you know, in, in a lot of operations, the groomer operator may be responsible for replacing any safety signs that are down, or you may be responsible for letting somebody know that is your sign crew. Uh, depending on what the situation is. Well, like I said, setting the edge, I mean, Josh and I have both had experience where guys go out and they find immovable, non-compressible objects along the side of the trail at a high rate of speed. And uh, like I said, it's, it's tough on everybody. Like uh, Mike Hino said this morning, you know, we don't want anybody kissing the windshield, uh, you know, because they're out, you know, where they're not supposed to be. As far as, uh, same thing, again, you know, f trying to avoid the emergencies or prevent the emergencies uh, is, is, like I said, the first part of this program, but, you know, how you're grooming your blind hills, you know, whether you're following your signs or not, and being consistent with, you know, where the sign trail is and where the groomer is, and, um, you know, I, I deal, you know, our, our club, I deal with about 26 different grooming operators. Most of them are really good, but we have a couple guys that basically have their own idea if the trail, you know, it's better over here because we got a little more snow, you know, and the, and the trail doesn't meet where the, uh, the signs are, so there's an issue with sometimes, uh, you know, having that happen. Road crossings for most of us is, you know, a, a, probably one of the biggest opportunities for issues. Uh, you know, one of the things is, is, is especially with an inexperienced operator, now, sometimes you have the opportunity to leave, a, you know, a yard or two of snow out on the road, which freezes into place very, very well and causes some problems for non-snowmobile, you know, car type people, or if the snow plows even because it won't push it out of the way. So, um, you know, make, make sure as part of your training in your preseason that your operators are all on, in tune as far as not leaving big piles of snow, you know, out onto the road and causing a hazard. Uh, 1,760 feet is the number. If you've got uh, a crossing that's at a relatively high speed, you know, you probably want to mark that because if there's a car past that 1,760 feet, it's going to hit you. <clears throat> if you get hung up on a road crossing, uh, do, you have, do you have some cones in place? Do you have a highway department or a, a local farmer or somebody that can help you get out of that situation? Again, that wasn't a problem last year. Most of us had too little snow and not too much, but it's going to happen, you know, at some point where, uh, you know, if you've got difficult road crossings, maybe, uh, maybe a local guy will take his, you know, his tractor down there, his payloader, and clean the, the, uh, the road crossings off if, if you don't want to be, if it's a busy enough road that you don't want to be pushing it out with your, you know, with your tractor, with your groomer. <clears throat> uh, couple things as far as uh, we had one old guy uh, he absolutely loves the groom and his idea of going out grooming was sneakers you know and a, and a light coat because the groomer he got a groomer he started with a uh, alpine so he was thrilled when he got a heated cab groomer so he's out there in sneakers you know in a light coat but what happens if you get in trouble so a couple things is you know like muck boots are a great choice uh, you know and a groomer having some kind of waterproof pants so if you do have to get out into the snow that uh, you're not back inside with, uh, you know, with wet clothes on that the next time you go out they're all frozen up. Uh, having an emergency blanket and uh, you know, a torch and a heater head. And it's so much different uh, even within our club. You know, we have areas of our trails that are close to town where every couple miles you know, there's a road crossing. We have some very, very remote areas, and I mean, is there anybody here from Canada, you know, northern Canada, or uh, 
what's your what's your longest distance, Mark? Wawa and some of the places like that. Uh, as far as how far you go before you cross any any kind of a paved road, any kind of a. Exactly. So it's a it's a it's a whole different situation, and yeah, you want to you want to gear yourself as far as how you're equipped, safety equipment wise, for that. But keep in mind that any of your machines may be called on to help out somebody that was in maybe a more remote area. So try to have a, a good uh, you know preparation type thing. Something you may want to consider. Uh, is making sure you have some of your personal items in some kind of a backpack or something that every time you go out and do your grooming shift uh, that that they're with you. Uh, you know, gloves, you know, warm hat, you know, pair of nice long underwear in case you do get wet. Uh, if you got a GPS at home, you know, there, it's you're not doing any favors by saving it there. Is take it with you. Uh, it could be your best friend. Uh, pair, even if you groom at night, a pair of sunglasses is good because you may end up having to run a little longer and run during the day. Uh, a lot of the groomer operators are my age and you start taking more and more medications. Is make sure whatever it is that you should be taking that you got a little bit of that with you. Uh, again, it's, it's a heck of a lot better to have it and never need it than vice versa. A <clears throat> couple things, uh, there's just a little picture of the one that I use. Um, one of the things that, that I think is kind of cool is uh, these little alligator lights. You know, if you're out there and you got to work on something at night, um, you know, you can clip that on, you know, anywhere, and so that you're not trying to hold a flashlight and figure out where you've got a hydraulic leak or an electrical problem. So just one of those little uh, type of uh, things that that's the technology today. You know, they're they're inexpensive. You can have one each of the groomers and 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 help you out. Uh, if you have multiple machines and you have a remote area, see if you can't schedule your groomers so that they're not out there creating a traffic jam, but one's close enough to the other so if somebody gets into trouble that you can uh, you know, help one another out a little easier. So uh, you know, we try to have all of our, our machines scheduled so that every once in a while they, they come up to one another. So that rather than having big loops where they're always uh, far apart, that we can try to work together a little bit. Something I'm kind of a big fan on is, you know, we're we're a long ways from our dealers, from our our uh, tractor, you know, our our groomer dealers. So we stock a fair amount of parts, and we have a program with our neighboring clubs where, that have similar equipment to us that we have some mutual aid and share parts, you know, between you know one another, and we can pretty well. Uh, from stock, have all the major, pretty much anything that would normally go wrong with a groomer, we've got it on the shelf. So, you know, if it's poker weekend and it's Saturday night and something happens, we've got the ability most all the time to be able to keep on going. Uh, and this varies by groomer, and, you know, Josh can help you on uh, machines. We got Al Cooper here. I can help you. Uh, the guys. There'll be a four track section tomorrow. The guys can help you there. Mark can help you on on four tracks. So what is specific to any of those machines that are out there? Uh, I can help you on a tractor. But basically, a couple things would be is if your machine has a lot of common hydraulic hoses, is it, it's not a bad idea to stock one. But we're going to show you how you can. Uh, get home if you broke if you blow a hydraulic line on anything but a hydro or a steering system uh, your track tool you know if it's a if it's a laced machine you know duct tape electrical tape uh, electrical connections a biggie is a fused electrical jumper wire and we'll talk about that when we get into the breakdown part uh, a lot of the experienced operators especially from years gone by you know are kind of part MacGyver if you've got uh, some stuff to work with, you'll get home and you'll get home, you know, warm and dry. A few other things is a spare wiper, you know, and a wiper arm. If you, uh, if you have access to a rope winch, uh, Josh can tell you exactly how much you can pull with a relatively small good rope, uh, but a rope winch and that will get you out of a lot of pretty bad situations. 
spare fan valve. Again, it's one of them things that's just excellent if you have one and never need it. Fuel filters, extremely important today because of the ultra low sulfur fuel. And we'll speak more about you know, the fuel and what's going on there and the challenges that you have today that we never had to worry about before. You know, some hardware, some Dutchman, uh, a spare cleat, and we're going to give you another reason to have a spare cleat here in a little bit. So as far as from a readiness standpoint, uh, it's very, very helpful to know what's, what's in that. If you've got, you know, more than one or two operators that really know the machine, is what do you physically have you know, in the different compartments, uh, you know, on your cat. You know, a little bit on, uh, on parts and phone lists, uh, and, and Josh brought up a very good point in the session yesterday, is don't be afraid to call uh, the experts, you know, out there, you know, the, the, your dealer or your manufacturer's rep that you know, or maybe there's somebody that's been around a machine just like yours that's been through something, and you know, have their number with you. So have a, you know, in your logbook, just have a listing of all the different phone numbers of people that, that'll help you out. When I did this, a session like this 10 years ago, we said, well, the mark of an experienced groomer was is they knew where every welder was and, you know, and every shop that was open in the middle of the night that they could get to to help get them going. You know, in those, in those 10 years, machines have become much more reliable, uh, but still there's things that can happen, and it's very good to know who's out there willing to help you uh, to keep you going. But a, a listing of parts is, is extremely helpful to have uh, you know, in the CAT, and what you physically have in the machine, and then also the phone directory. And as I said before, uh, if you've got neighboring clubs that have a similar machine or the same machine as yours, is try to set up like a mutual aid plan on parts where you can work together and, you know, uh, you know, or you may have a situation where you have two of one model and one of another and your, your neighboring club's got the opposite. You know, they can stock parts for their more popular one and you can for yours, but you can work back and forth together, uh, you know, to come up. And, and again, the dealers, uh, and the, the kind of the grizzled veterans of this sport can give you a pretty good darn idea of what you want to have around that's possible to fail. A little bit on hazards, you know, out onto the trail is, you know, do you have some, you know, mechanism in place to identify, you know, before the season, during the season, and at the end of the season, you know, those, those immovable objects, those rocks or those cutoffs or those tree stumps that are out there uh, so that you can get, get them addressed, you know, you know, mark them during the season and then try to get somebody in there with an excavator, again, to, to eliminate the, you know, the, a lot of the damage and things that occur. Okay, so the machines are pretty doggone reliable today. Most of the problems that, that we see are self-inflicted. You know, something has happened, you know, they hit something, uh, did something stupid, it really wasn't that the machine just let go you know, with no warning. A little bit on, uh, you know, on chainsaws is uh, how many uh, have a requirement for chainsaw training if you operate in federal land or county land or private? Yes. Okay. More and more uh, are requiring that now. And that's not, a, I'll tell you, that's not a bad deal. You know, we sort of said, ah, you know, we've all run chainsaws all our lives, you know, and you go to a chainsaw course and it's darn good information. The second half of that is your first aid training. Uh, and uh, again, um, if you think about it, you're out there in the middle of the woods, the cell phone may not work. You know, you may be a long ways away from some help and that, uh, that half a day on first aid and uh, chainsaws can make a big difference uh, for a lot of people. Get in the habit of whenever you get out of your, your cat is make sure your phone is with you and before you get out, make sure it works. Do you have a signal? Uh, if, you, if you've got an area where your signal is you know, on and off, have a fairly good idea of where does it work and where doesn't it work. Um, I lost an alternator a couple years ago and um, I, I said, I know the phone works because somebody had called, you know, 100 feet up the hill from where I was, but it was dead where is that. Walked up the hill, called the guy. By the time I got to the road crossing, he was there with an alternator. We kept on going. But Show if you, of hands, how many people actually have two-way radios and keep in contact with the base area? Let me 
you guys do. Three? Yeah, yeah, good, good, yeah. good deal. That's something. I mean, no matter what the emergency, whether it's an alternator or a thrown track or drag falls off or anything else, you know, to be able to communicate and say, hey, base, I'm getting out to do this. I think I got it under control. I'll get back in touch with you. And then if they don't hear from you, you know, you got the open dialogue. Yep. Uh, where we are in Muskoka, we actually have cell service everywhere now. In fact, they're building towers now that look like trees just to keep all the cotton seeds happening. But anyhow, that's good for us. Definitely. Uh, we, we don't do the two-way radio thing because you can always get out somebody there is able to pick it up. And I don't do that in the morning. So we contract with a local call center, which happens to be a taxi place. And they phone in every time they get in the thing to go where they're going, if they get out and they'll leave, whatever. Got a tree back in the phone and right to the end when the shift's over. That's and great. That's probably the most effective and cheapest. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, is that for pay service though? You have to pay yeah, them to do bucks a month who cares? Yeah. 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 That's, that's great. They're, they're very good. And then, of course, we have the new GPS system that if you want to sit up all night and watch it, or dawdle a little bit. Something I don't do either. <laughs> I like to sleep. Yes, sir. Right, Dave? Yes, yes, and, and we see that in some areas. And, and again, a lot depends on your situation. If you're the only one out there and it's extremely remote and your phones don't work, that's a great insurance policy. Uh, so, okay, and we'll, and we'll talk about uh, that, I think maybe even the next slide, I don't remember. Uh, yeah, so like, just a little bit more on safety equipment. Uh, another thing I'm kind of a big fan of is having a reflective vest in, the, you know, in your machine when you get out of it uh, so that, you know, people can see you. If you're grooming at night when you're supposed to, you know, when a lot of people, when it's best to do it, uh, sometimes some of the riders don't have total judgment like they normally would. And, uh, and you know, there's a difference too in, in how you, you know, if you're under a machine or you're stepping out or you're working with a, a branch or whatever, uh, just having that, uh, you know, does make, you know, you know, it does make a difference. Talk before about having, yes, sir. That reflective thing's a great idea, honestly. The problem you have is you have people who get in a cab and forget to put it on. So we've made it mandatory <clears throat> for any guy who's working on the trail day or night to wear one of them. Uh, that's what you got. All the conversations out of it then. Yeah, yep. There is no, oh, I forgot. Yep. And most will forget because it's like they're just getting up to do whatever. So it's mandatory. Sure. Absolutely. Okay. We've seen some clubs in, in the New England area that have done groomer jackets for the guys, and they'll just get this reflect, reflective piping and put it on there. So you just, you know, it's a lightweight jacket that you're probably going to want to be wearing in the machine anyway. So if you get out, you've already got that on. You don't have to worry about it. And then, you know, Josh has, uh, he's got a, uh, like a contamination kit here that, you know, works very well if you're in a sensitive area as far as, contaminated snow and having the gloves and the uh, the mats, the absorbent mats. So if you do have a spill, a few years ago we did a program and we talked, you know, about a number of things. And we said, you know, if, if you're an odds playing person, if you like to play the horses or, you know, bet on anything, if you were betting that you were going to blow a hose, would it most likely happen where everybody would see it or would it happen right where your trail crosses the Sierra Club's trail? <laughs> you know, and, and uh, so, you know, so a little due diligence like that, you know, goes a long ways. I'll have this up here for anybody that wants to come and look at it, but it, it, it includes these diapers that are super absorbent, will soak up any of the hydraulic oil, motor oil, whatever it is. And then it's also got a dam included with it, so that if it is really coming out, you can at least contain it to an extent. It's got a um, plastic bag in here and rubber gloves and also phone numbers and stuff like that. So. These are relatively expensive. I know our parts department sells them. I think they're 50 or 60 bucks. Um, but they're pretty readily available from a lot of different sources as well. Probably a good idea to just keep, it, especially on the environmental side. If you've got some sensitive areas or you're dealing with landowners that really hate to see that red trail of oil following right across their property, um, you can do yourself some good with one of these. And this, I mean, even in the daylight, you can kind of see the difference between you know, guys wearing vests and guys not wearing vests. 
the other advantage of these, if you're doing trail work in the fall, if you're wearing one of these and you're on your utility vehicle and you're cruising out and a landowner comes storming out, the minute they see that vest, go, oh, you're the club, you know. Hey, it's good to see you guys. Thanks for, you know, for everything rather than, you know, the damage control conversation that, that you had while the guy is cooling off. Something else, uh, Josh talked about the green zone yesterday as far as your engine RPM. There's also a green zone, you know, for your, your temperatures, uh, your oil pressures, that, uh, it's, and your voltage. So it's not a bad idea to take a little marker and put a little green zone on all of your gauges you know, in your machine so that if you're going along and it's like something don't smell right or something don't feel right, it's like, well, maybe my voltage, you know, is running 12 rather than 13 and a half. Um, but then you know, well, what's, what's normal to, uh, to do that? Just a, a little simple thing that could save you some trouble uh, out onto the trail. Something that I try to stress to my guys is if, if, you, if you're parked and you're at, at an idle, don't have unnecessary electrical load on. If you're, if you're parked somewhere, you do not need to have the door open and the heated mirrors on and the fan on full and every light on the cat on. Um, well, I mean, it'll keep up, but uh, as the machine starts to get more hours on it, you start stressing the electric with the alternator, and it's not going to fail right then. It's probably going to fail when they get out of it and I get in it. So uh, just a little thing for guys to try to save a little bit of wear and tear onto your machines. If you drag or one comes uncoupled, uh, color code your hoses so it's that much easier to, uh, to hook up. Um, I'm a big fan of cameras. Uh, rear vision cameras, even in a machine that has good rearward visibility, because now uh, what's going on in the drag is in your forward vision, so you can watch what's going on in the front of the machine and see what's going on behind you. Uh, on this particular machine, the camera's right there. There's two. There's one watching the bowl, and there's one on there. So if you've got to back up by yourself and hook up, uh, you can see right what's going on. And uh, like I said, that's what it looks like. Uh, on the camera. You know, this just a little thing, but uh, a machine gun like this for putting up signs, if you have one for your trail work, is keep it in your cat in the winter. It's a lot easier as groomer operators if you've got to replace the sign, not to be messing around finding screws and finding the gun and the bit and everything. It's all right there. And, in, you know, in three seconds, you're, uh, you, you know, you're back running again. You can buy these for a hundred bucks now, so they're very, very uh, cost effective and very, very uh, quick. Same thing with permanent posts. You know, if you've got areas where guys like to run posts over, you're not in a farmer's field or, you know, somewhere where you physically have to take them up on and off every year, but, you know, a three by three treated uh, post, snowmobiles don't seem to like to run them over anywhere near as easy, you know, as a two by two. Uh, if you're Something, again, this is more prevention. It really doesn't have to do with a breakdown, but, uh, you know, <clears throat> a, a limb shear that mounts on the front of a tractor can save hours and hours and hours of hard work, you know, out on the trail. So uh, kind of a, of a cool thing, you know. I mean, most of the areas that you have, you know, everybody and their brother's got a compact tractor or a small tractor. Um, you know, this goes on the front in place of the bucket. It goes up in the air 16 feet. You can cut a tree off at 8 inches diameter at the ground, move it out of the way. Uh, so you can sit in your cab and it's a, it's a good uh, saver. Just a little bit on operator training. Uh, everybody has their own program. Some, you know, associations and some clubs and counties have a, you know, specific uh, agenda for it. Uh, this is the one that's in the kind of the groomer operating, you know, the groomer manual that's online that, you know, was put together for the kind of for North America. Um, but for, for some people, I let, they like to have as part of, again, a training and prevention, you know, type of thing is to have a, you know, a basic course on, you know, grooming and safety and snow. Uh, to have people that plan to operate a groomer actually get out and do work on the trail so they know where those stumps are and those off cambers and those bad spots. You know, being able to know that groomer, uh, we get that a lot and they go, well, I run a bulldozer all summer long, I can jump right in that cat and, and run it. Or I'm a farmer, and I'm used to running a tractor, I don't need any, any training on it. Well, there's a lot more to it than what most people realize and all you guys realize that because you've been there. 
Um, the other thing is, is working on preseason maintenance. Anybody that does maintenance on a machine, preseason maintenance, has a way greater likelihood of not busting it up because they understand how much stuff is going on there and uh, they're a little bit more careful with it. You know, and then the last part of that would be having, uh, you know, experience kind of in, you know, as a ride along shotgun guy and then like a learner's permit type of thing. Yes, sir. To have it or not to have it? To have, to have it, yeah. We, we unfortunately were involved in a situation and a groomer was struck by a snowmobile. Of course, they sent it the other way around. So, so the, right, yeah, you were traveling at 5 and they were at 60. Yep. We had the documentation of operator training, safety certification. They just missed it immediately. Documentation. Yeah, that's great advice to everybody. Yeah. And there should be record of the fact that they read it. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. So. How many of just show of hands? How many of your state associations or province associations, as the case may be, do some kind of an operator orientation or, or certification? About half, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, that's something that should probably be brought up to the to the associations that that's just in terms of liability if nothing else that's something that should be done yeah exactly and and uh, and, and we see it you know uh, some of the some of the guys that have been around a long time like mark uh, and uh, and I have been you know at this a while and and you know we see that the you know the break you know the, as the training gets better we see less breakage the trail quality is better it it definitely helps everything we do is is helping on it you know selection of ops, office uh, of uh, of operators uh, the biggest thing we try to impress on our guys is just because you went through those five steps is not a guarantee that you're going to get a seat in that in that cat you know, there's some people that are that really ought to be doing something else and uh, and it's and, and it's and it's and you know sometimes you know we say we're short on people but if you're if your regular people are too busy doing damage control uh, because of somebody you're better off to you know to make that difficult decision and and, and it's not an easy decision quick thing on operating guides is so somebody mentioned that they have a policy that they always have to have a passenger. There's always two people out in the groomer. Uh, whether it's a policy or whether that's how you operate, uh, it's, it's good to have your passengers that aren't going to be actual operators. Make sure that they understand their role. You know, what are they there to do? When should they not be, you know, talking, you know, in a difficult situation? Um, you know, a little thing, but, you know, get in the habit for everybody uses a three-point stance when they get in and out of the machine. You know, the tracks are slippery, you know, you fall on a, on a cleat, you're not going to win. Uh, you know, those little things like that uh, kind of eliminate the emergencies and the injuries down the road. Uh, do you have a drug and alcohol policy? Do you have a maximum shift length policy as far as how long, you know, under normal conditions should somebody be out there? You know. In the, old, in the good old days, we'd have guys that would groom for 14, 16 hours straight. That is really not good business, uh, you know, to do that. And, uh, you know, operating alone. You know, some, some organizations say you've got to have two people. Other ones use some, some judgment. But it's, it's good to have that established up front. And uh, seat belt, same thing on the seat belts. You know, do you have something? Uh, one of the guys that we talked about setting the trail edges, you know, he got a good education from the School of Hard Knocks because he wasn't wearing his seat belt when, he, when they smacked the rock. The passenger wasn't. And when he smacked the windshield, I mean, he, he was a hurting, you know, he was a hurting dog for, for the whole rest of the season. A um, little bit from documentation is, uh, you know, if you do come across a, a, uh, an accident or a situation, 
you know, do you have a disposable camera or do you have a camera on your phone and take a few pictures because usually the ambulance chasers take about a year and by then, you know, the details get a little bit blurry. You know, and a couple pictures uh, do a, go a long ways when a situation comes up. Like you say, it was the groomer operator's fault because he was going five mile an hour and the guy was going 72. What, what's that? You were that Yes, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and like I said, the operate, you know, there's an operation manual that a lot of clubs have, or a policy manual if you want to call it that, and there's the operator's manual for the machine. But it's, it's, uh, it's excellent to have both, to have some structure in place. Uh, the price of these machines is getting higher. The liability is always a factor. And we don't want anybody getting hurt. We want to do the best job, save our resources, uh, and do the best possible job. So, quick thing on storage and security. Uh, if you're in, a, in an area where you have to lock your machine up, uh, make sure that your emergency stuff is not locked up when you're out on the trail. You know, that's going to be the time that the lock's going to get frozen when you desperately need something fairly quick. So, you know, and again, everybody's different there. Uh, if you're, if you've got a number of different locks and gates in your system, see if you can have a common lock so that everybody that needs to get in already has a key. You know, all the groomers do, you know, all of the, you know, kind of the, the operators would have that. For as far as fuel storage goes, again, to try to prevent a situation out on the trail, you know, middle of the woods breakdown is uh, how are you addressing your fuel additives? Is your supplier putting a good additive package in? Are you doing it on your own? And uh, make sure with uh, what's happened is it's phased in. I don't know, how many, how many people have to use ultra low sulfur diesel fuel now? And how many guys are using off-road regular low sulfur? Anybody know? A little of both? Okay. It used to be if you had red dyed fuel, it was low sulfur and then the highway fuel was ultra low. That's not the case in many areas now. It's, it's changed. Ultra low sulfur fuel is, has a much higher likelihood of absorbing water in it and it has a lot less lubrication in it to start with. Uh, that creates a whole myriad of opportunities out here and you want to be aware of that. So when we say about stocking some fuel filters, keeping them in the machine, same thing with your storage, uh, where you store your fuel at. And um, for most operations, unless you're going to, unless you're driving up to a fuel pump somewhere, you know, a truck stop or something and fueling it up, you should be dealing with three water traps. The water trap on your fuel tank, your storage tank, the one on your, fil on your fuel filter, you got traps on all your filters, right? Al, you do too. Yep, too. Yep. And then there's, a, then there's a water trap on the water actual water tank. Water Yeah. <laughs> it was dirty out. We love you for it. Yeah. You see it happen all the time. Yeah. Don't do that. Yeah. yeah. You, don't, you don't have to do that. You don't have to do that. But be aware there is three different water traps. And what worked, what was fine for you several years ago, you want to be a little bit more uh, religious on is checking your water traps because you are going to see more water with ultra low sulfur diesel fuel. Not a bad idea if you're in wooded areas to have a chainsaw helmet in the machine uh, and get in the habit of using it when you're outside. You know, the, 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 the $1.99 Walmart, you know, first aid kit is probably really not adequate for what we are doing and where we are at. You know, a, a good OSHA, ANSI type kit with the gloves and uh, the bloodborne pathogen stuff in it is probably good business to have in all of your machines. Uh, as you mentioned before, uh, Josh has got a, a real nice kit there uh, that has kind of the, the get you home stuff, you know, which is, that would be, you know, brand specific for a piston bully. Yeah, and that's something, talk to your manufacturer. I think, pro I'm sure Free Not sells something like this, Tucker probably does too. But, you know, it's just basic to our machine. It's got the light bulbs for a, your different light um, in the cab and on the grab rails. It's got one of each fuse that you'd need. It's just, it's real quick and easy, it's small, you can keep it in the glove box and, you 
know, to be down and having to walk miles out of the woods because of a blown fuse is not what anybody would call a good night. A couple other things. Uh, we try to keep up in, in, in our wooded area, where we have a lot of wooded areas, uh, we, we generally have two chainsaws in each of our, uh, in each of our cats. We keep the little one in the cab uh, so that A, if you do need it, it's going to be a lot easier to start and uh, you're more likely if you don't have to you know, go out back and dig it out of the, the back if there is a branch that, that needs to be done. It just saves time and makes for a better uh, you know, opportunity. If you've got a GPS uh, you know, unit or you've got it on your phone, it's, it's great to have that information. They talked about that yesterday from what I understood in the Trailsides Emergency class. Uh, if your phone has a GPS in it that will transmit for your operators, make sure it's turned on so that, you know, it does, if I remember right, they don't come on. You've got to turn them on right. for most phone people, but it's there, you know, don't charge anything for it. So if you're in trouble, uh, you know, you can call 911 and say, do you know where I'm at? Is, is my GPS signal there? And you're not trying to worry about reading coordinates and all that, but if you don't have that, you know, having a, a handheld a lot of times is a lot better than, well, yeah, I'm out by where, you know, you know, Charlie killed that cow years ago by mistake. I mean, you know, it's a much better, uh, you know, way to, uh, to go. Another thing that will help is to work with your county emergency planner. You know, they, they do this stuff, you know, as a job, uh, if you don't know who that is, just talk to your local fire chief because they will know. You know they'll be very good about that. Um, and again, they'll they'll give you a tremendous amount of, of help and information. And you know maybe something like that, they could find the the means to get it for you. You know if you're not, you know, able to fund it for yourself. Little foam pad to kneel on if you're outside the machine. Again, saves you from getting wet. Um, doesn't take up a lot of space. For your uh, for your cordless drill and your, uh, your your light. If you've got a little charger, if the two of them are common, they have a common battery, if you've got a little charger inside that whenever you plug your block heater in, it comes on, then your batteries are always charged. Okay, now let's get into, okay, we've done all this preparation and something happened. How are we doing for time? We're done. Wow, okay. <laughs> uh, we'll keep rolling. Then. Yeah, absolutely. You know, Couple different situations here. The ones that have the little stars on it, we're going to address in the next slide. But you know, think about an, on a, if, if something happens to the operator, they have a heart attack, they have some, you know, something happened to them, you know, out on the trail. Um, big thing is, if a guy is not in the best of health, you know, he really needs to be out. He or she really needs to be out there with somebody else. Uh, they, you know, those people shouldn't be out there alone, you know, no matter what. Uh, we talked about it yesterday. If you get, anybody got across the railroad? Okay. You know, a little bit yesterday. What if you get a cleat caught, you know, on a crossing somewhere, you know, and you're hung up on the tracks? You know, what can you do about that? And, and one of the guys had a great idea. So whenever you cross the tracks, cross on a little bit of a skitter so that the, the cleat can't fall in and get hooked into the track. Um, and, uh, you know, how, if you do, you know, have to, you know, to get out, you know, do you, if you cross the, if you cross that, do you have the, the local dispatcher's number? Say, hey, you know, we're in trouble out here. If there's a train coming, try to get them stopped, you know, so we don't have a problem. What's, you cross a, a rail, I mean, is there a, a law or a rule or a procedure to follow, or how does that work? If you did have a problem there, say, I mean, even if a machine broke down or something happened, what do you, what's the well, procedure? Luckily, there's only a train at uh, 5 p.m. and it's something out in Hot Money that night. Uh, I guess the objective is to get that thing off the track as many times right. as you can. Um, yeah, that's great. That's a good point right there, yeah. though. If you do have to cross, know the train schedule. Schedule, yeah. Figure out how to go over them right after your train goes by or sometime after. 
Yeah. 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 That's that simplifies it all right there. A little bit on accidents as far as uh, try to include that in part of your training so that when an accident occurs, it's like, okay, we, we, you, you'll, you'll, you'll kick in instinctively. Uh, you know, if you've had a little bit of training, say, okay, who's going to be in charge of this situation? Is it be the groomer operator? Is there somebody that's got first aid, uh, you know, education there or, or knowledge? Uh, but find out somebody's going to have to take command, you know, and, and determine immediately who that is. Big thing is, is stay calm and stick to the facts. It's like there's no sense of getting into an opinion match. On, you know who caused the accident. Let's let's get the, the you know if somebody's injured, what you know what's what's the best course of action? Is are they can they be transported out? Can they be bandaged up? You know do we have to medevac them out? What where do we got where do we got to go and what's the best way to get there with the resources that we got? Um, like I said before, uh, you know, GPS and provide some maps. Your, your, your maps, your online map or your maps to all of your highway departments, to your rescue, to your, uh, to your local fire companies so that, you know, if something does happen, they know where the road crossings are, they know where the trails is in between, and they're able to respond a little bit better. A little bit on down, you know, down trees and branches. Now get in the habit, whenever you're in a wooded area, when you get out of the machine, just look up and look out for the widow makers. Uh, you know, you're typically if there's if there's branches down, it's because there was some wind. Uh, so, you know, just a little thing that uh, may help. You know, keep you from getting clocked by a, a branch that you weren't that you weren't expecting. Kind of determine whether, you know, it's something that you can handle, or does it have to be? Uh, does some help have to come on? You know, that helmet and the safety equipment on hand, and the same thing with your saws. You know. Balancing off of the you know the corner of the track to you know to cut a branch, you know over your head is not a good idea. Let's talk about mechanicals for a minute. If you have to go to the to the railroad session, it is starting right now. So we're like I said, we were supposed to have an hour for this. Uh, you're welcome to stay. We'll spend whatever time uh, you would like. Uh, from a breakdown standpoint, uh, same situation is is let's look at the. You know what's going on here? Can they? You know, is the operator able to make repairs? Should they be calling in saying, "Hey, I'm broke down. I think I can fix it. I will call you when I'm done." Uh, or are you going to need some help? Or are you going to need some parts? Uh, as we said before, know where the where the, uh, the cell phones work. Have an understanding uh, for common. You know, for com know what the common problems are. You know, if it's fuel gelling, a broken hydraulic line, derailed tracks. And then uh, we, we talked a little bit already about the environmentals. Okay, I think most people know this, but say you blow a line going back to your, to your drag, you can reverse your line and go home and make it a one-way cylinder. The only place that that will not work is on something that's double acting. So your angle for your blade uh, and your power steering, that will not work on. But uh, for, to raise your drag or to raise your wheels, you can take the line off of the raised size, and that's also one that breaks. <clears throat> Hook the one from the lower side, which happens to be a longer hose, if it's designed like it's supposed to be. Right, Mark? And uh, <clears throat> you'll be able to you'll be able to run home. It'll, it'll, you won't have down pressure. Uh, understand the difference between gelling of your fuel and freeze up. Uh, again, nowadays you more likely will have an issue with freezing than with gelling. Gelling occurs in the filter. Freezing normally occurs in the pickup line coming out of the fuel tank. Uh, if you want to find out if there is an issue with freezing, you won't have any fuel when you go to pump the, uh, the primer, you know, back on the machine, the hand primer. To find out if you've got a pickup tube, take your line off the top of the pickup tube, unscrew it, put your thumb over the end of the pickup tube. When you pull it out of the tank, if it's all clogged up with ice crystals on the screen on the bottom, it's froze up. You, know, it's froze up. you can get home by temporarily running the pickup line above the water level on it. So again, you know, there's, there's things you can do you know, out there you know, to make that happen. Track damage. Uh, you know, again, you know, every track is different, but you know, have the pieces that you need, whether it's a Dutchman or a repair link or one of those little alligator clips to, uh, to get you home. And then know how, if you start to derail a track, 
you know, a lot of times you can get them back on, uh, and and get and guy, you know, guys like Josh can be very helpful to uh, to do that if it's not completely blown apart. We can help for that too. Yeah. <laughs> if you uh, if you break a panel hitch, uh, there's two reasons you did that. You backed up and jackknifed it, or like me, you got mad and backed up when the drag was up in the air and the tail was down, you jackknifed the drag up in the air. When you came back down, the thing went over center, crashed down, and broke off the panel hitch. Uh, so, you know, get in the habit when you back up of not having your, your drag, you know, nosed up heavily, because that's, that's exactly what happens. That was a good $1,000 lesson for me last year, and I should know better. If you have an axle or transmission failure, Know how to disconnect your planetary drive or release your brakes. And uh, you know, like that tractor that thought has got an electronic brake, uh, a lot of the machines have a, a hydraulic released spring applied brake. There'll be a, a release kit available for those. If you've got a mechanical drive machine or if you have planetaries in it, a lot of times there's a, a pin you can take out of the planetaries to release the drive. Know what you have to do to release that so you don't have to uh, drag the machine and fight your hydrostatic, your hydrostatic drives. That's also something you're going to want to check with your manufacturer. Everybody's got a little bit different procedure for what you do, how far you can tow it, you know, all, all the different details. Yep. So definitely be aware of who, what you own and talk to the people that know what to do with it. If you, if you uh, like I said, four tack machines, you can typically get home from one end, whether you lose some steering control over it or whether you use drive control. And uh, so there is a way on those to get home. Electronic, a lot of the electronic machines have a limp function to get you home. Uh, that tractor out there, if something would happen with the electronic brake, there's a limp home function you know, to it as there is to a lot of the, the engine components today and the transmission. There's, there's some kind of a safety factor that again, you really need to know from the manufacturer. Electrical failures. Uh, so the, Biggest thing for the simpler machines is if you've got a little uh, jumper cable with you, a jumper wire that's got a little die or a little uh, circuit breaker on it, that you can power the uh, the fuel solenoid, the fuel shutoff solenoid. Or you can power the uh, the starter, you know, relay, or you can power the lights to get you home. <clears throat> and then uh, yesterday, you know, Josh was talking about you know idling, and again, have a, have a situation for your club. You know, we, you know, we have a program that when our machines leave and go in a remote area, we never shut them off. You know, we don't trust <laughs> the electrical system uh, for what little bit of fuel we're going to use. When you go to tier four, if you're going to have a particulate filter machine, you, you're going to want to shut them off a lot more often than what you're used to. But for the older machines, you, know, you should just determine that as a club. Uh, you know, I understand the reasoning for not leaving them running idle. Uh, if you're in a remote area, you may want to consider how you're going to manage that. If you slide into a ditch or you get stuck in the snow, uh, in the old, in one of the early uh, OSFC manuals, there was a little thing in it that said you were better on hook your drag sooner than later. Uh, and uh, be, if you're stuck and you're not making progress, you're better on hook the drag before you have to unhook the drag when the machine is broke or torn up. Uh, avoid the temptation to spin tracks. If you do have to unhook the drag and get out and you can't get close to it, you're better off to pull it out backwards. If you pull it out forward, it's going to dig in and you'll have a, a problem. If you hook short and pull it out backwards, you know, you can move it a long ways without it fighting you hooked up. Uh, if you have a, a drag that slides into a regime, or a regime ravine. ravine, thank you, uh, <laughs> you know, or uh, into a ditch, you know, uh, you can take and uh, use a long chain or a rope to secure the back of it when you pull ahead, you know, it'll swing, you know, in an arc and pull it out. You know, make sure, you know, a lot of guys know how to do that. You know, they've been around the woods all their life. Uh, you know, other people may not have that and, and help them out and show them how to do those little things. You know, how to make an anchor if you don't have something to, to winch or pull off of. And that's a good place to use that spare cleat, you know, driving in the ground at an angle. You're going to have to do it off the trail where it's not frozen, you know, and secure it with two more you know, behind in some short chain. Uh, but basically, that's, you know, what we had. Any comments, any, anything that 
experience from the School of Hard Knocks. Yes, sir. All you have to do is call Collet. If you, no, if, you're, if you don't have one in your machine now, get a hold of Collet. Have, have somebody in your club do it for you, better yet. And uh, they will send it to you for free. And that's absolutely the right way to go. And for a little while, you know, they were on the ropes and this and that. But I, I, I know last year, we, you know, we're good to go. But excellent, excellent point. Again, just... No, exactly, and, and we appreciate that. I mean, this is the first, I've done groomer programs for 15 years. This is the first time we've done like a, a breakdown accident, you know, specific one, and we'll add that in for the next one, because that's just excellent, just that's excellent, cool. excellent. To answer your question, I think you'll see it more and more, without a doubt. From the, from the factory, do, does There's anybody have them? We do direct from the factory, I think, probably because you can get them free from another yeah, source, free. but but yeah, they're, they're definitely just gone in the drill. For all the yes, sir. R drag, we have them on the units and all the points, and uh, snowbirds are like, wow. Yeah. Yeah, the. Of course, night riding, I joke is you can look at it from a satellite picture and see the groomers on Goose Blue. It's that bright. Oh, yeah. And. The world of difference compared yeah, it, to the traditional lights that you guys put on. Yeah, the, re the revolving ones that are on the top, they get covered with snow, or yeah. you, you, know, you don't have any visibility. You're right, they're excellent. They're we sell it as an option when guys are purchasing new machines. Oh, yeah. We'll put them on there. If, they, if uh, yeah, we'll There's a couple clubs in New Hampshire I know that re requested them, so yeah. we put together a kit and get it all set up. We just did it last year. It was probably the most popular thing about it. Yeah, yeah, it's great. No doubt about it. Other questions? Yeah. Definitely don't as a standard. Uh, yeah, New York, we, we have one in one of ours on a, on a trial basis. Uh, most of the counties got one or two last year, you know, in our state to do that with. So, yes. Uh, and again, it was to track the mileage and the time they were out and how much time they were idling and all that. But uh, it'll work for that just like the one in your phone will. Yes, sir. You have to leave a drag in the wood. What should you put on it? Yeah. The, one of the things on the, on our list there, and this is on the uh, the website for the snowmobile administrators, is the groomer safety course. One of the things that you want to have is some tape. You want some cones, you know, off the side of the road, you know, with reflective tape around it, to uh, to be able to mark, you know, any hazard or mark, you know, a drag that you couldn't get, you know, out of the way. Yeah. You know, and then you know, we'll. And you want to make sure you do it say you know, a quarter mile, half mile, and a mile back, you know, so people yeah. notice, hey, there's something coming, there's something going on. Like the flashing beacons on too, uh, yeah. If you've got battery yeah. operated. Yeah, yeah you could. That. Yeah, it's a great idea. I don't know that everybody would have access to those, but sure. So basically, uh, I do have a, a one handout here, which is some of the things we talked about, some things that, uh, on top of that, of some things that you may want to share with your operators as far as some safety tips and some things to do if you're out on the trail and you get in trouble. So, you know, they're up here. You're welcome to them. I do have a couple of uh, handouts of this program. I believe they're going to have this on a disc or a CD or something yeah, I think that's yeah, the plan. so that it'll be uh, available. So this actual presentation will be available and, uh, you know, go from there. But. Any other things that you'd like to see on this, if we were to do this, this program again to make it better? You know, anything you want to add? You know, spend less time on the, 
you know, operate or the, you know, prevent preventive stuff and more on operational. I mean, we're we're pretty flexible here. We want to do what is year. most valuable for you know the people that are that are out there. Any other thoughts before we let you go? Okay. Well, Great. yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you.